I invite you to turn to Nehemiah, the 13th chapter. And we want to talk about going uh, backwards in your walk with the Lord. There are times in your life and mine that we we seem to take uh, two or three steps forward, and then all of a sudden we're at least a step backwards for some reason. Now, we've still advanced overall, but there are times that you kind of slip backwards. And... When I first came to know the Lord as a, as a small child, I, I invited Christ into my life. I, I, I knew it at that point. But whenever I'd sin, I'd think, oh my goodness, I've lost it. I'm, and what would I do? I'd pray the same prayer that probably a number of you pray. I don't think, Lord, I, I must not admit it. I, I, I've sinned again. And I'd, you know, I'd feel so rotten on the inside, and I, and I would just, and I'd say, Lord, I want to ask you into my life again. And what I needed to really realize at that point is there was a reason I was feeling rotten, because the Lord was in my life already. And what was He doing? Convicting me of sin and righteousness and judgment. You know, people that aren't believers, when they sin, they usually don't feel too badly about it. Do you understand? Sin is something that, that God is, can make. Let's say intimacy in marriage. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And who made it? God did. <clears throat> so in marriage, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Outside of marriage, it's Satan taking what God made and distorting it. Still has all the feelings of goodness, <clears throat> except if you're a believer, you say, oh man, I'm in sin, I'm convicting. But for an unbeliever, do you think that they feel badly when they have an intimate relationship, in, uh, even outside of marriage? They're not, con- they're not convicted. The Holy Spirit's not in their lives. They just keep going for it. But one of the greatest indications in your heart and mine that you have trusted Christ as your Savior is when you do sin, there's a sense of guilt, conviction. Oh God, what have I done? And then he moves your heart to get back with him. So in the book of Nehemiah, what happens is they have made all these commitments. They're just charging ahead. And then all of a sudden you see in chapter 13 where they've started to go backwards in their walk with the Lord. Now, you know, in the 13 chapters, as we've gone through those 13 chapters, you've begun to see in chapter 8 where they open up the Word of God. For the first time in years, they hear the Word of God in the Hebrew tongue. And what's their response? Chapter 9, they confess their sins. They get right with God. They want to make some commitments. So the end of chapter 9 looks like this. Verse 38, in view of all this, of all of what? In view of what he's read in the word in chapter 8 and what they need to do in the conviction of their sin, the confession confession of their sin in chapter 9. In view of all that that's gone on, they say this, we are making a binding agreement with you, God. We're going to lay it all down. We're going to make these commitments and we're going to follow through on that. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never made a written agreement because it goes on. We are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing. You ever done that where you say, oh, God, I tell you what, I'm going to write it down and then I'm going to sign my name. I- I've never done that, but I have made binding commitments. I've said, Lord, from now on in, here's what I want to do. I'm going to vow my life. I want to give you a vow that I want to move in that direction. They made that kind of a vow in chapter 9. And they move on in chapter 10 in making a commitment that everybody can sign. The end of chapter 10, you see these words. Verse 39, the people of Israel, including the Levites, are to bring their contributions of grain, new wine, and oil to the storerooms, where the articles for the sanctuary are kept, and where the ministering priests, the gatekeepers, and the singers stay. We will not neglect the house of our God. That 
is the bottom line for them. I want to go to God's house and I want to come into God's presence. Now, you'll have to understand that the Lord didn't live in the lives of those people. Different from you and me. We have Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27 says. You have the Holy Spirit living in your life. The Holy Spirit would come upon people in the Old Testament and then it would sometimes do what? Depart. Leave. But when Christ came down, went back to heaven, he said, I'm going to send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, and he's going to live with you. You know, I've said it many times in my own heart when I think about it. To live, to live with me 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. I mean, he doesn't even get a break from you. The Holy Spirit's there every day with you. And we drag him through some of the worst situations. So they make this commitment. We're not going to neglect the house of God because, man, we can go there. We can focus on the Lord. His presence will be there. This is chapter 10. Chapter 9, they're making a commitment. Chapter 10, they're saying, here's what we're going to do. We are not going to neglect the house of God. Look at chapter 13, verse 11. Nehemiah says, I rebuke the officials and ask them, why is the house of God neglected? Chapter 10, what are they saying? Oh, you've got our commitment, Lord. You're right with you. Three chapters later, what have they done? I, I can't do that moonwalk backwards, but they're, they're backing up away from the Lord. They've made that commitment, and they're no longer keeping it. Look, this isn't the house of God. It's an area, you know, where in Jerusalem, or around the region where the temple was. But let me just represent the house of God by this and say, here's what kind of happens in our lives. It's prominent. It's focused. But before we know it, it just kind of is less in our lives than it was before. And and while it's still there, it's just less than it was. And before you know it, again, we start neglecting the house of God. It's still there, but it's less than it was. Do you remember what it was like when you first came to know the Lord? Remember what it was like when you were so embedded and engrossed in the Word? Remember what it was like when you wanted to serve God? And then everything got busy. I can hear some. Oh, my kids came along, and the job, I got the promotion, and I got the move, and I got this happening, and I had to take further studies. And I just didn't have time to serve God anymore. If you don't have time to serve God, you're too busy. But for some, it's almost like this. While the, while the, the house of the Lord, or maybe you just say the Lord, while it's still there, over a period of time, it can just do what? Just diminish completely. And I'm wondering where you are in that commitment you've made to the Lord. You make a commitment, you're running for it, and it's just a few days, a few weeks, a few months later. Or maybe for you it's a few years later. And you're not as close to the Lord as where you used to be. You just kind of passed out of your life. And if you've gone backwards with the Lord. What I want to share with you this morning is this. That Satan wants you to fail in your commitments with the Lord. You make commitments and you fail. And Satan's there going, hey, hey, all right. Oh, that's great. Man, if I can just get them to make some more commitments and not really mean it. If I can get them to say, I'll do it, Lord. I'll go here. You know, it'd be better to just make Short commitments that say, Lord, I'm going to spend four minutes a day praying for the the four people. Or I'm going to spend five minutes a day reading the Word. You know, for some, and you would have to admit this, for some, five minutes a day, every day, would be more than you're spending now. And just to say, Lord, I'll, I'll give you. I'll start there. Start someplace. But make a commitment that you can keep. The problem we have, and, and often in our church, we don't, we don't say, okay, come forward and, you know, make this kind of a commitment. I shared with you, it was years ago in, in my home church, week of missions. Uh, and probably that's where, you know, we get the idea of missions in, in our services here. Years ago, our church focused on missions all the time. My uh, senior pastor, the, the pastor of my home church, 
said to me, they had posters that they made, you know, for contests, missions poster contests, you know, that the kids could make up. And then they award, you know, places and they gave them missionary books to read and follow, just tied it all together. Of course, I'm not even an artist. And if you've ever seen me on the overhead projector, you know I'm not the artist. And so he said, hey, how about if you make a poster? And I was, I was about in seventh grade. And I'm thinking, you like, you're right. I'm going to, it's not even cool. You know, you think I'd want to be cool as a seventh grader, right? He said, I tell you what, you make a poster for missions and I'll put it right on the ceiling. I'll, I'll put it right on the ceiling here at church. Now the ceiling, I looked at that ceiling and it was about 20 feet up. And I thought, I'd like to see him have to do that. So I put together, you know, I, I got something that, you know, I traced out kind of a wanted ad or something. And, and it was, you know, wanted missionaries. And so I, I did it. It wasn't much of a thing. It was just something that, you know, I could have him have to put it on the ceiling at church. Missions Week conference came. I go in the sanctuary. I'm looking around. I don't see it any place. We had this fellowship time dinner downstairs in the fellowship hall, in the basement. And I go down to him and I said, hey, I didn't see my poster. He said, oh, it's right. And he had it right in the basement, in the corner, at about eight feet high. And I said, oh, man, you got away with that, didn't you? He got me hooked into making that kind of a commitment. Just enough. But that kind of a commitment today even fuels our mission's commitment here today. Satan delights in having you fail at your commitments. Nehemiah, when he opens up, he comes at them and he says, look, there are six areas that you guys have failed to tackle. And he starts to open up these areas. They made a commitment. They failed at the commitment. What's the first commitment? It's this. They failed to separate themselves from the world. You know, if you're going to fail to separate yourself from the world, here's what's going to happen. It, remember, it's not a problem for uh, like a boat to be in the water. But when the water gets into the boat, what happens to it? It sinks. It's not a problem for you to be in the world. But when the world gets in you, what happens? You start to get down. You start to pull back from the Lord. And that's what happened in their lives. So look at it, Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 27. I want you to get the background. As we go into chapter 13, I want you to see the background to it because chapter 12 just kind of spills over. Remember, there were no chapter breakdowns when this book was written. So we have these artificial breakdowns so that I can tell you to turn chapter 13, verse 1. So chapter 12 here flows right into chapter 13, and here's what it says. At the dedication of the wall, so this is what's going on in chapter 12. They're celebrating, hey, we got it complete, 52 days, and wow, we're protected. So at the dedication of the wall is chapter 12, verse 27. Chapter 43, uh, verse 43 of that chapter, it says this. And on that day, they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. Verse 43, on what day? On that day, what day? The day the walls were dedicated. Got it? You go into the next verse, verse 44. At that time, men were appointed to be in charge of the storerooms for the contribution, first fruits and tithes. What day? At that time? What time? The dedication of what? The walls. By the time you get to chapter 13, he begins with this. On that day, the book of Moses was read aloud. What day was it? The day the walls were dedicated. So they're excited. They're praising God. They've made commitments. And on that day, look at the entire verse, verses 1 and 2. On that day, the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people. And there was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God. Got that? And he gives why. Because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam to call a curse down on them. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. You hear that wonderful kind of thing? God's in the business of turning all things for good to them that love the Lord. So he says, these are the people I don't want you involved with. 
the Ammonites and the Moabites. What do we know about them? It goes on in verse 3. When the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign descent. Now, the issue here is not racism at all. The issue for them was, if you marry these kind of people, you marry their gods unless they come out from the false gods. And every group had its god. He said, so I want you to stay away from them. Verse 3, what are they doing? Separating from them. But by the time you get to verse 28, 23, rather, it says this. Moreover, in those days I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Hello? Verse 3, don't have anything to do with them. Verse 3 says, they separated from them. Verse 23 Hey, let's get married. He goes on, verse 25, he says this. I rebuke them. By the way, I, I make no claims to explain why the action that goes on here. I rebuke them and call down, I call curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. <laughs> I can't imagine that going on. Can you? I mean, Nehemiah has got to be 60 plus at this point. I mean, he's 30 to 40 years of age when he's over in and the cupbearer for the king of Egypt. He's 12 years in, in this area. King Artaxerxes was in his 20th year when he started. He was in his 32nd year. When we get into this chapter. He's a guy that's pretty intense. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. I made them take an oath in God's name and said, you are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. Verse 26. Was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among the many nations, there was no king like him. He was loved by his God. And God made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by foreign women. So he's saying, look, you made the commitment. Why don't you follow through? Well, because you got close to God. And then you got close to that woman or that guy. And it started to pull you away from your God. But he doesn't stop here. Verse 27. Must we hear now that you too are doing all this terrible wickedness? and are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women. That's why I want you men, who especially have daughters, to make sure that when a guy asks them out, that you step in there and take responsibility. Don't just assume somebody else is going to make sure that that young man is safe. Don't assume that somebody else is going to make sure that that young man is going to treat your daughter in a godly way. You know, I first, when I uh, moved to uh, where Audrey grew up, that was, oh, 500 miles, 500 plus miles from where my folks were. So my folks didn't get the joy of knowing her, watching her grow up, those kind of things. It's always fun when, when you as a parent have the joy of, of even seeing them grow up. Not that you have to, but it's just kind of fun to see that. You remember them, they made commitments and walked with the Lord. So my folks had nothing to do. They didn't really know her very well. So the first time I decided, you know, I'm on, on the phone with them and she's there. It's in my office. I was a youth pastor in my office. And I'm talking to my dad. And I said, hey, uh, this girl here, you know, I've been telling you about, you know, I said, you want to say hi to her? Well, of course, what do you think Audrey is doing? You know, so, I mean, Audrey was so, she appeared to be so young at that time and still appears to be young. Did I say the right thing? <laughs> that when we got married, people would come to our house and ask if her dad was home. And she'd get so upset at that. I was a pastor. At the time, I was the senior pastor of a church at the time. And they knock on the door. Is your dad here? 
no, but my husband is. And she'd say, she'd be more like, no, but my husband is. <laughs> like, I'm grown, you know. So she's this young gal, 19 years of age. And I said, would you like to talk to her? And she's going like this. She goes, hi. You know, the first words out of my dad's mouth were, are you saved? <laughs> Do you understand? Do you understand the priority that that put right from the start? Man, it, it wasn't, oh, it's nice to talk to you and, and let's lead into this. Man, it was, hi, are you saved? <laughs> right for the juggler. Why? Because he said, look, my son is committed to the Lord and I want somebody who is committed to the Lord as well. Make no apologies. Tell your kids right from the start. We will not, we, we will only bless believers in your relationships in, in leading to marriage. And you get that out right from the start. And you lay that foundation right from the start so that when they go to make commitments, they know right from the start where you're going. You might even say to them, by the way, the first question I'm going to ask them is this. When they come and ask if you can, they can take you out, the first question they're going to hear is this. Don't negate your responsibility there. But he goes on in this text. He points out that they're failing the Lord. And how do they fail the Lord? They fail to separate themselves from the world. They get involved with the Moabites, the Ammonites. What, God, what does God say to us about this? In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, he says it this way, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. He just lays it right out there. If you are involved looking to marry an unbeliever, that is sin. It's as willful a sin as you committing adultery, as you lying, as you stealing, as you taking God's name in vain. He's saying, don't do this. Verses 14 to 17, 18, it goes like this. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Verse, six, uh, verse 17. Therefore, come out from them and be what? Separate. Can you say it? Be separate. The question I have for you today is have you separated your life so that the Lord has the most important, has all of you? Now we understand it if, if we say, if a wife says to a husband, no, you, you haven't separated yourself. You're still, you're, you're married to me and you're wanting to date other women. Is that separation? No, not at all. When you are given to one person, that person knows of your affection, your love, your time, your support, your encouragement, and certainly that you're not involved with somebody else. God is just saying, where do you stand with me? Have you come out from among them? Are you looking for marriage in that way? Come out from among them, be separate. Look, Satan wants you to fail in your commitments, right? He wants your kids to fail in their commitments. And Nehemiah opens up six areas. The first area was they fail to separate themselves from the world. The second area is they fail to recognize who the enemy was. Do you realize that many times kids begin to think that their parents are the enemy? You just don't want me to be happy. You want me to be miserable. I love this guy. And they begin to think of you as the enemy. Why won't you let me do that? Everybody's doing that. Well, if everybody else is doing it, there's probably no room for you. Yeah. But they begin to look at you as the enemy. It's interesting. Some of you men begin to look at your wives as the enemy as well. You begin to think, your wife says, what did you do? Where would you go? Where'd you spend, where'd all your money go? <laughs> she says, yeah. <laughs> my, 
I'll give you just kind of a little personal insight here. Uh, I, I don't carry a wallet, and so I carry my license and, and you know, whatever whatever money my wife gives me. And and she's so good at it, you know. In every house, don't feel like you have to uh, be the one that does the checkbook. Have the person that's detailed in your house do the checkbook. As long as there's accountability and godliness. I, 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 my wife left the checkbook on the, on the counter the other day because her window was going to be replaced in her car that had cracked. She said, I'm leaving my car here. They're supposed to come by and you sign the check. I said, wow. Get to write my check this year, huh? <laughs> Cause I don't think I've written a check this year. But you don't have to write a check to be the head of the house, to be the spiritual leader in the family. And sometimes that gets confusing for guys. They feel like they need to do it all. Why do you think God calls her a helpmeet? She's supposed to do what? She's there to help you. If you're not letting her do things, what is... Well, that's a whole nother subject, right? But what I'm saying to you is, is, is this. There are times in, in your life and mine, we, we think our wives are the enemy. My wife can, I'll, every night, I take everything out of my pockets, put them on the, the, the bathroom counter there. She'll say to me, oh, what'd you, what, what do you spend money on today? She'll, it's, she doesn't even have to go through it, you know? She'll say, I, you know, maybe had a 10 there last night and then now it's a five. On top. And I'll say, <laughs> do you guys see? Is she the enemy? Is she the enemy? No, she's not the enemy. She's just inquisitive. Inquiring minds want to know, you know? <laughs> and all I'm saying to you is, why wouldn't you want your wife to hold you accountable for money? Do you know where guys get into trouble? When there's no accountability. And they spend money in areas that is unwholesome. So they didn't recognize who the enemy was. Let's go here in, in Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 4 and 5. Verses 1, 2, and 3, he says, Stay away from what kind of people? The Moabites and the Ammonites, because they have other gods, and you worship the only true God. Now he's going on in this verse, and he says, before this, Eliashib, the, high, the, the priest, had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah. What do we know about Tobiah? Chapter 2, verse 10 says this. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the what kind of person? Ammonite. And who were they supposed to stay away from? The Ammonites and the Moabites. But these were the two, Sanballat and Tobiah, who were the enemy. And here's what it says in chapter 2, verse 10. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, that Nehemiah had to come back and they're going to build the wall and they're going to put things back together, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of Israel. By the time you get to chapter 4, here's what it says. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's wall had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. Who's in this group? Tobiah. Who appears in chapter 13? Tobiah. Look at the whole group. Samballot, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites. We already know from chapter 2 that who's an Ammonite? Tobiah. But it's not just Tobiah the Ammonite. He's got Tobiah and the men of, Ammonite, of Ammon who are going after him. And here's what he says. When they heard that the repairs to the Jerusalem walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. The question is, 
Who is the enemy here? Tobiah. But let me give you a map of kind of uh, areas of the Middle East. By the way, uh, down over here is where David and Marine have been involved. Let's zero in on this area. I'm just going to move up like that. Here's the Dead Sea. Here's the Jordan River flowing down into the Dead Sea. Mediterranean Sea over here. The groups that we just said, there was Sanballat, there was Tobiah, there was the Arabs, there was the men of Ashdod. Here's where they live around Jerusalem. They were surrounded by the enemy. But in chapter 13, what do you find? Here's the one that's listed. Tobiah. Here's what Amos says about the Ammonites. Amos chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. This is what the Lord says for three sins of Ammon. Even for four, I will not turn my, uh, I will not turn back my wrath because he ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order to extend his boundaries. Do you understand such wickedness? I'm going to extend my boundaries, therefore. And he takes the pregnant women and just gouges them open. And they were from where? The Ammonites. So what do we know about Tobiah in chapter 13? Somebody was closely associated with Tobiah. Some Jewish person was closely associated with Tobiah. And what did he do? Provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple articles. So what did he do? Look it. They gave room to the enemy to be right in their midst. Do you understand that? You'd think, hey, they're the enemy. We don't want them living here. Instead, they put them right in the temple area and give them a room where all the, the possessions had been held, the grain and other things, the incense put them right in their midst. Listen to me carefully. Sometimes you put your kids right in the midst of the enemy when you don't check things out first. And you say, oh yeah, I didn't come over. Oh yeah, I have them come on over. You know, kids get involved in drugs because someone introduces it to them. Kids, kids get involved with the wrong potential mates. Because they meant somehow. You just need to be aware of what's going on. But it's easy for me to say, you know, because I kind of let you off when I go, and the kids can do this. Folks, you get involved with the same things. Sometimes you don't realize who the enemy is. There are enemies to the cross of Christ. And you need to be on full alert. When you're moving around unsaved people, you can be a friend to sinners, but you don't have fellowship. What fellowship has light with darkness? You can have friendship. Again, Jesus was a friend of sinners. Why? He was going to win them. And plus, bottom line is, he's God. He's not going to sin. But you and I have enough of a sin nature you know, the, the difficulty that we have is we're just enough. We have the Lord in our lives and the Holy Spirit, and that's enough that we can't even enjoy sin. We go out there and you try to do it, and you what do you do? You feel guilty. You have just enough of the Lord, you can't enjoy sin, and you have just enough sin that you really can't enjoy what heaven's going to be like until you get there. Where sin no longer has any reign all of your life. Amen. They gave him a room to the enemy in the midst. Look, what did Satan want to do? He wants you to fail in your commitments. Nehemiah, of anybody, man, they have built the wall, they have fortified the city, they have set up the, the temple, they have read the word of God, they have confessed their sins, they've made commitments, and then they start to backpedal. And what I'm saying to you, 
to my own heart is, can we keep going forward in our walk with the Lord? You know, it's gonna, and it's not gonna be easy. Satan's gonna be trying to tackle you all the way. And you just lean into it and you say, God, give me the strength. I want to go forward with you. Nehemiah tackles six areas. The first one was what? They failed where? To separate themselves from the world. The second area? Failed to recognize who the enemy was. The enemy here was Tobiah. And they gave him a room right in their, right in their house. Do you realize <clears throat> that you give Satan a room in your house by some of the material that gets mailed into your home? By some of the things you watch on television that your kids see? You let him just take up residence there. But there's a third area they were failing in. <clears throat> it's this. They failed to see that they had an enemy not only in Tobiah living there, but they also had an enemy who was right within the ranks of Israel. Nehemiah, going back to verses 4 and 5 again, it says, Before this, Elishab the priest had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. Eliashib. He's a priest. He's in charge of the house of God. And what's the next sentence say? say he was closely associated with Tobiah. you got to be kidding me. Who would have read the scripture in the first part of chapter 13 that says, have nothing to do with an Ammonite and a Moabite. Separate them. Don't let them come into the assembly of God. The priest certainly would have known the word. And here he is saying, oh, come on in. Come on in. Right within their midst. Is he nuts? <clears throat> what do we know about him? Chapter 13, verse 28 says this. I, I almost read it, misread it when I went to read it uh, the first time in verse, uh, in verse uh, 4. It says this, one of the sons of uh, Joyada, Son of Eliashib, the high priest. And if you heard me when I when I went, I'd read it so many times here that I instead of said Eliashib the priest, I said Eliashib the high uh, the priest. I went back and corrected it earlier on. Here's the high priest, the one head Kahuna, and what is he doing? Come on, let's have who? Tobiah. Come on, live with me. Be in, be in the house of God. Can you believe that? Here's the high priest not getting it. He's, he's backpedaled so far that he's not even going to obey God's word. He's going to flat out deny God's word right in front of the people, invite them to come and live in God's house. But there's another problem in this verse. Eliashib, the high priest, one of the sons of Joyada, son of Eliashib. Okay, so you got Eliashib. He has a son, Joyada. And Joyada has a son, unnamed here in the text. One of the sons of Joyada, son of Elijah, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat. Let me give you the order again here. Eliashib has a son, it's Joyada. Joyada has a son who's unnamed in this text. And that son is Eliashib's grandson. And the grandson of the high priest marries the daughter of Sanballat. Remember Sanballat in chapter 2 and chapter 4 was the enemy? They're the people that used to have nothing to do with, he said. Look, here's the problem they had. Eliashib is close to Tobiah and gives him a room in the house of the second problem is this. Eliashib's grandson is Sanballat's son-in-law. you got these two people that everybody thinks, oh, Tobiah, Sanballat, problem people. Early on through Nehemiah, you just said, stay away, stay away, stay away, stay away. 
Now they've made a commitment to the Lord. We will obey your word. We'll separate from those people. We'll take care of the house of God. And how does it end? They're going to backpedal away from God and just do just the opposite. Because what's the real problem? Elijah the high priest was closely associated with Tobiah. Question I have for you today, you know, is are some of these areas, when Satan wants you to fail, and Nehemiah starts to probe at the areas that need to be corrected, are one of these three areas anything that God needs to touch on in your life today? Are you willing to be separate, to come out from the world, to stand with the Lord? Are you going to fail in that area? Are you going to recognize who the enemy really is? You know, there are times that I've said, I've named names uh, of, of people in, in ministry who, are, who have drifted from the Lord, people in ministry who, who preach, um, who don't preach God's word. One Sunday, I, 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 I named a guy, a uh, prominent guy that people would know, and I, I said, you know, he's really an enemy of the cross of Christ because he never preaches salvation at all. Never talks about the blood of Christ. Always makes another way. You just got to be good and you're going to make it to heaven kind of thing. He's an enemy of the cross of Christ. After the service, one of our people come up, came up to me and said, Pastor, why do you feel it's necessary to attack people like that? Is it so you look better? I said, oh, man, no, it's, uh, I said, I, do I look any better? You know, I, uh, I, I'm a shepherd and a shepherd wants to keep the sheep from the wolves. And our elders want to do the same. And we want you to know who the enemy is. And we want you to pray for the leadership so that they aren't the enemy right within. That we're not slipping away from God's word. That you challenge us to keep coming to the word and you keep opening the word and you search the scripture to see if it is so. Like the Bereans did. Here's a question I have for you. Have you lost ground in your walk with the Lord? Nehemiah gave six areas. This week we'll look at the first three. Next week we'll wrap up the last three in Nehemiah. But the question I have for you today is have you made commitments? And gone backward in your commitment for the Lord. Let me just throw one other story here. I started to tell you about our missions conference in my home church. One one night, the missionary gave a call for those to become missionaries. I want to say 10 to 12 kids went forward. He asked people to come forward, stand with them. Say, I want you to stand with them. I want you to commit to praying for them every day until they make it to the field. In my home church, I can tell you that day, my family usually sat right over here on this side of the auditorium. It's like you, you always sit in the same place. you know. Except that night, I was with my mom and I was right over in this section. I didn't go forward. On the way home, sometimes you ought to, you ought to just look up Sherman, S-H-E-R-M-A-N, New York, on Google. Go to that, that map. See how big that town is. You can go right in on Columbia Street where I lived and walk right past the school where I attended and look right straight into the church. Because this is a little town of like 500 people. So my mom and I were walking home that night and she said, uh, this is good. You, your moms and your dads ought to do this. We're walking. It's dark because it's night. That way you're not looking at each other. It's not a serious time. It's a serious time, but it's, I didn't think it was that serious, but I remembered that talk. We're walking and she says to me, I, I noticed you didn't go forward tonight. Was there a reason? She's going to hold me accountable. Did you hear that? 
I said, you know, I, I just, I don't know whether that's what God wants for my life. You know what's interesting about that? None of those ever went to the field. Now there were people from that church that serve the Lord today. But it's easy sometimes to make an emotional, quick decision. But it's another thing to follow through on it. I'm just asking today, have you made some commitments and then drifted back? Have you lost ground in your closeness with the Lord? You are getting closer and you turn back and see those commitments. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, would you grasp our hearts today? You said if we would draw near to you, you'd draw near to us. And so we're praying that you would grab our hearts, hold us closely to yourself, that we could take greater steps in our commitment for you. Father, I'm going to pray for our people and Lay them before you. I'm praying that the commitments they make, oh, they'd be able to keep. They'd make commitments today to separate uh, from the world, not so that they could just be apart from the world, but so that they could be closer to you. Lord, you said that friendship with the world is, is enmity with God. That we're not to love the world. Neither the things that are in the world. We want to have you first and foremost in our lives. We would confess that we slip, we walk backwards, we backpedal from you, but we're asking today that you draw our hearts to you. While your heads are bowed, while your eyes are closed, Would you say to the Lord today, Lord, you know, I'm not as close to you as I once was. You are softly and tenderly calling me home. I want to come back today. I want to come back and be close to you again. I want you to pour out your spirit on my life so you can use me the way you used to. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. I pray these things in Christ's name.